as she says, I'm Juliane. I'm an engineer at Snowflake. I have been there since 2021, so roughly over three years, and I'm working in the search and pruning team. So what does the search and pruning team actually do? We accelerate queries by skipping the processing of irrelevant data. I will explain that in a bit more detail soon because that's the important part. We're accelerating queries, and this talk is about accelerating top K queries. So you can already guess we're doing that through pruning. <laughs> um, but for that, maybe some context on Snowflake itself. Uh, Snowflake is a cloud data platform, and I'm working on the like core database part of the platform, so the cloud database. And this cloud database is split into multiple layers. So you can see like a vague overview here where we have the storage layer, which is separate from the compute layer. And that enables us to like have multiple workloads running against the same data at the same time. And then those workloads are executed on the compute layer, which you know uh, actually scans the data, processes the data, does all of that stuff. Uh, the compute layer consists of what we call virtual warehouses, and those warehouses can have different sizes. And this is because, you know, it's a cloud platform. The one big benefit of the cloud is that you have flexible compute. You can have multiple machines working together at the same time, and so the size of one of those warehouses denotes how many machines you have working simultaneously. Because this is designed for big analytical workloads, where sometimes you want like 64 machines running in parallel to process your terabytes of data, uh, because else it's just going to take forever. And then on top of all of that is the cloud services layer, and the cloud services layer uh, has a lot of different jobs, but the main one we're interested in for the context of this talk is it takes care of the compilation. So that means that when a customer writes a query, usually in SQL, against uh, their data, the compilation layer takes this query text and transforms that into an execution plan. And this execution plan then gets sent to the compute layer where it gets executed. And part of this execution plan is the information which data partitions need to be scanned to execute this query. And that is where pruning actually comes in, because pruning is the step that identifies which data partitions have to be scanned. So we have metadata available in the service layer. This is separate from the main data itself. And based on that, we can decide which data partitions need to be scanned and which can be skipped. Uh, an example for that is, imagine you have this table. This is now a very nice small table, good for an example, where we're storing scores and names. And the metadata is we have multiple different kinds of metadata. But here, for this example, we're mostly interested in the min-max metadata. So for each column in each partition, each of these red blocks is a partition of the data we have the min and max value. So we know that the scores in partition 1 go from 94 to 99, and the names go from A to M. Well, oh, I mean, max is technically after M. I should have put <laughs> N there. But uh, <laughs> you get the idea. Uh, same then, partition 2 goes from F to T and uh, 85 to 89. So now if a customer whose table this is writes a query that says, please give me all of the scores uh, where the name is Neda, then we can check, take this predicate, the filter, where name equals Neda, and compare that to the metadata, which means that we can already identify that partition one will not contain any value that is necessary for answering this query. And if you're like, used to more traditional on-prem database systems, you might say, why don't you just use a B-tree, and that will tell you exactly where the value you're looking for is. And the answer is, as I said, it's a cloud database. It's designed to deal with massive workloads of like, tables that are tera to petabyte large, and they're keeping a B-tree around. It's just going to be a lot of work and a lot of storage and not really feasible. So instead, we do this. And then, of course, uh, based on min-max, if your data is not ordered in any way, oftentimes you will not be able to do a lot of pruning, and then you might want to uh, redistribute your data through clustering. But uh, we in the pruning team just assume the data is however it is, and we do the best we can with the metadata we have. So second thing, this was how we accelerate general queries through pruning. Uh, now there's the topic of top K queries, and what actually are top K queries? 
Uh, the simplest way to put top k queries are queries that have both a limit and an order by. So you're saying, like, I want the top 10 something. Um, in this case, we want the top 10 entries from the table based on score. And you can see here that an order by has a order specified. So you can say, do you want to order descending or do you want to want to order ascending? And also, do you want to put nulls first or last if there's nulls in this column? And then you have the limit, which says how many rows is this supposed to return. And when you have this query, the query plan that gets generated, the execution plan, uh, you can see a visualization of that on the left-hand side there. So we have different operators that will process the data. The first one is the table scan that will load the data um, and then send it to the sort with limit operator, which will uh, implement both the order by and the limit. And the reason we do both of these in the same operator is because if you have like a massive table, table with millions of rows, you do not want to order the entire thing just to return 10 rows. <laughs> that would take absolutely forever. So what we do instead is we keep track of the 10 largest rows seen so far if we're ordering descending and just keep updating those. And we will also go through this with an example. So let's say the table scan scans its first data partition. These are very small partitions for the <laughs> point of the example. Uh, and it contains these scores. And so we also have metadata for each partition, as I said. So we know that this partition contains scores from 7 to 100. And then this data, these rows, get sent to the sort with limit operator. The sort with limit operator knows that in this example, actually, we're only interested in the top three. So gold, silver, bronze. <laughs> and uh, so it identifies the three largest values that it had been re received and throw the, throws away all of the other ones and just keeps those around. So then the table scan scans the next data partition, uh, finds new values also here because it's an entire partition, we have metadata, and we send that again to the sort with limit operator. And now this operator is somewhat smart. It knows, huh, I made a mistake here. <laughs> it knows that anything smaller than 89, not 100, uh, will not make it into the results because it only keeps around the three largest values, right? And so it can immediately filter out all of the values that are smaller than 89. And so it just keeps the 99 around, inserts that, you know, replaced places, stay 89, and now it has the three new largest values. And this keeps going on because, you know, we have many, many partitions in each table. And, well, not each, there can be small tables. <laughs> and so here the table scan scans the next data partition, which has the metadata 3 to 97, sends that to the sort with limit operator. And here, because now we know that any value smaller than 99 will not be part of the result, will not be part of the three largest values in this table, actually, we will end up filtering out every single value <laughs> uh, from this data partition. And if you've been paying attention, you know, we have metadata for the partitions, and this metadata already tells us that there's no value larger than 97 in this entire partition. So instead of going through each row and realizing it's too sm small to go into the result, what we could have done is just take this metadata and say, we don't need to look at any of these. And ideally, actually, we wouldn't be doing that in the sort with limit operator, because by that point, we have already loaded the data and spent quite a lot of time on that. Ideally, we would have realized this in the table scan already. Before loading the data, just have a look at the metadata, which you know is tiny compared to the actual entire data of the, file, uh, of the partition, and said, we don't need this. We don't need to look at this. However, this is information that we do not have at compilation time. It's not in the execution plan itself. This is something we have to figure out while we're already executing, because we need information from the sort with limit operator, which changes over the course of the query execution. And so this is how we actually accelerated top K queries in Snowflake, uh, by adding pruning to them, or more pruning to them. So basically, if you have a top K query, then you end up sending, like scanning data partitions, sending rows to the sort with limit operator. That keeps around the k, smallest or largest, depending on your order, rows. k 
comes up with the boundary value where it says everything below or above this can be discarded. And then, com that's the new part, communicates this to the table scan. And the table scan, before downloading a new data partition, actually compares this value with the metadata it has and completely skips data partitions if they are unnecessary for answering the query. However, if you recall, when I introduced sub-k queries in the beginning, I pointed out that in addition to specifying whether you're ordering ascending or descending, you can also specify if you want to put nulls first or last. So this is something that's important to keep in mind here, because if you're ordering nulls last, you're fine, you can just completely ignore any information about nulls. If your boundary value isn't a null, then anything that is a null can be discarded anyway. However, if you're ordering nulls first and your boundary value isn't null, that means that you actually have to take this into account because min and max do not reflect if there's nulls in a data partition. This is a different entry that we also have, luckily, in our metadata. So what you actually have to do down here is you have first have to check are there no nulls in this data partition, and only if there are no nulls, then you can check the min and max. Else you might end up pruning partitions that do contain nulls, and those nulls would have made it into the result. So you will return wrong results, which is uh, absolutely not what we want to do. <laughs> um, a little bit about where can we actually apply this feature, because there's some considerations there. Uh, we can have more complex queries than just uh, select from order by limit. So for example, you can have predicates in those queries. We will also prune on those predicates um, before doing the top K pruning. But uh, filters, uh, as I pointed out here, is completely supported because the boundary you get that you do prune with is generated based on already filtered rows. And that means that uh, you can prune data partitions completely because either the rows would have passed the filter, and then if they don't pass the top K boundary, you can prune them, or they wouldn't have passed the filter, in which case you can prune them anyway. So <laughs> this is completely safe. You can add as many predicates as you want. They will not stop us from us using this feature. There is, however, a fairly common use case that sadly we cannot support with this feature, which is aggregations uh, or group by queries. So in this case, let's say our table contains an entry for each user, uh, the score for every time they played. And now you're interested, what is actually the highest score a certain user ever achieved? So you group by username, and then you order by their high score. And that means that there is an aggregation in between the table scan and the sort with limit operator. And an aggregation is what we call a pipeline breaker. The point of those is that they have to consume every row that the table scan will produce before they can produce an output, because else they might have not seen the row yet where, with the actual high score of a certain user, and they might send on, out the wrong information. And that means, in turn, that the sort with limit operator actually ends up not having a first boundary while the table scan is still scanning. In which case, you know, we cannot do anything in the table scan because we don't have the value to prune with. Uh, a different problem also in this particular query is that we're ordering not by a column, and we, which we have metadata for, but by an aggregated value. And for those, we just, you know, don't have metadata at the moment. Who knows about the future? But uh, as far as I know, there's no plans for that at the moment. Right. So the interesting part gets to the meat of it, the results. We actually saw massive improvements in runtime, in particular queries, to be fair. There's, even with these um, limitations of not being able to support, support aggregations queries, we have millions of queries running on Snowflake a day that can benefit from this feature. And most of them are not as extreme, but we have absolutely seen queries that became like 500 times faster because they go from scanning everything to scanning like a handful of files, which if your table is large enough will make a massive difference. Um, one of our customers actually recently released a blog post where they were talking about how they use Snowflake. And they mentioned this feature in particular and said it brought their queries from minutes to milliseconds, which oh, I love that quote. <laughs> um, also, of course, we did some of our own tests. We are not just relying on what our customers tell us. And here you can see we actually have a tool to rerun customer queries with new features turned on and off. 
And in this graphic, the two dots, that when they are vertically above each other, they represent the same query being run once without the feature turned on and once with the feature turned on. And what's interesting here is you can see we have some very short running queries, and they might improve. They do often improve, but not by a lot, because they're already fast. There's not much you can get there. And then even for the slower queries, there's some where you can see there's barely any difference. And then usually those are cases where there's a very selective filter in the query. So it just ends up that, I don't know, you're getting the top 100 elements, and only 150 elements make it past the filter. So it just takes forever to get the first boundary to prune with, and then it's not as effective. But sometimes, especially if you don't have a selective predicate or just no predicate at all, it can make a massive difference, as I said. And you can see we have some queries here that, in this case, actually might have gone from minutes to milliseconds. Uh, 600 seconds is yeah, 10 minutes to somewhere pretty far down here. <laughs> so uh, right, in summary, we use the boundary from the sort with limit operator in the table scan already to skip the processing of unnecessary files. And that allowed us to massively reuse the runtime of certain queries. And yeah, if you have any more questions, we have, I think, like four minutes for Q&A now. And if you want to know more later, we also have a booth. Uh, Snowflake has a booth, and you can come talk to me. OK? <laughs> Thank you, Juliane. Any questions? <laughs> uh, so, uh, in this case, the optimization was, uh, in general, beneficial to queries. So, yes. there was, weren't any regressions, I guess? Uh, or were there? Um, not in the end, I think. When we started out, we did run a lot of tests, and sometimes there were regressions uh, because we are doing some additional work, right? We have to get the boundary, and we have to compare it to the metadata. And if it's just your data is sorted in a really bad way, <laughs> uh, where you never end up pruning anything, uh, or it's just not a lot of distinct values, and you cannot end up pruning anything. Then sometimes we saw some slight regressions. However, we got rid of most of the things that caused the regressions. And also, one of the most common things uh, we saw, where we saw regressions, was very, very fast queries, where just adding like 100 milliseconds actually made them slower. Um, and so we ended up turning the feature off if you had very few data partitions to scan anyway. Um, but yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I was curious about what's the flip side of enabling this feature in terms of uh, maybe cost. So you were talking about updating metadata. So I would imagine you need to um, update this metadata set all the time. No, actually, we have the metadata already in general. Uh, we just have to make it available in new places. Um, and that's not much of an overhead. So really, we're saving our customers money, because the customers pay per compute. And if your query goes from minutes to milliseconds, then you have to just pay to, for milliseconds and not minutes anymore. So this is a feature that, for our customers, was purely beneficial in terms of cost. We didn't have to add any new metadata. We just had to change uh, how we use it during query execution. So why don't they enable this by default? It is enabled by default. OK. <laughs> OK, yeah. So this is enabled by default. Uh, I think for over a year now, we just released the 500 was uh, with some add-ons that we worked on in the past year, 500x, uh, that were also just released. And it's applied automatically to every query it can be applied to. So customers didn't need to do anything. Their queries just got massively faster if they were lucky. Thank you, Ilgane. Thank you for your attention. And we are starting with the next talk in 10 minutes. OK. Thank you.